Yeah. Not lawful stupid. Well, that depends on the type of paladin. It also yeah, it depends on what edition it is. You know, and what system, and yeah, yeah I mean, you, we don't even know if it's D&D, &D. it could be anything, uh, so. Yeah, are we talking uh, Voltron? <laughs> I mean, oh, by the way, oh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, so I guess Voltron's rebooted recently, right? Yeah. yeah. Season 6 episode, Three. was it you who told me that? Yes. Yeah, well, I forgot to mention it to everybody else. Oh. But did they know that they did an entire role-playing episode? They played Dungeons and Dragons. For well, they Iron called it they called it uh, something else. There's a made up name, but Monsters and Mana. Yeah, yeah, Monsters and Mana, and it had kind of a 3D board table. I'm gonna have to look but, because I've been enjoying it, but I just yeah, it was yeah. an entire episode of them doing role playing gaming and explaining role playing gaming, I'm and gonna have to watch. them going, "How weird is this?" and then how much they loved it. So that gets added to our list of media mentions of role playing mm -hmm. gaming. And they they. There's so season six, episode there. three or thirteen, I forget oh, which one. Like season that. six, yeah, I, I know. I'm like, what? wow. <laughs> yeah, I thought I I only got to like season three. So, and it has a ton of tropes in it. I mean, all the oh. stereotypes and tropes in it. Well, to be fair, it, it is, but it's done humorously. So they, you know, at least for the first couple of seasons, they do a good job of of uh, um uh, playing around. They're aware of their tropes, and they're turning some of them. For example, the uh, I think the one who rides the green dragon, um, historically, that's a skinny male dweeb. And for the first season, they go through the entire season, the majority of it, being very, very ambiguous on what that gender is. Okay. And it isn't until like near the end, it's like, yeah, that's a female. And only one person didn't know. And everyone was like, well, why didn't you know? Because it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> So they're very aware of their tropes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So check that out. I, I thought that's uh, so that's Voltron. I think season six. I've, you... Yeah, season six, episode three. Three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. Uh, and you Patreon supporters, because we just started a new clip. So this is, of course, RPG Research. Um, we just finished our administrative meeting, so that Brooke could go ahead and check out. Uh, you Patreon supporters will probably only hear that if you're interested in hearing all of the administrivia of our our weekly functioning and all of the different challenges of trying to run a nonprofit and run our programs and getting ready for the tour and all of that. So that will be uploaded just before this clip, and that probably won't be made available to the general public. It'll probably be Patreon exclusive. Who knows? Uh, but this clip here, of course, will be Patreons first, and then eventually, after about a month or so, give or take, will be available to the public. Uh, we are continuing, uh, this is part two of the lecture and discussion on Tuckman's theories of small groups and forming, storming, norming, performing, adjourning, and reforming. And adjourning is intentionally mispronounced from the normal adjourning. Uh, part one we did last Thursday, and that's already up at the Patreon page, uh, uh, patreon.com forward slash RPG Research. Thank you so much, you wonderful Patreon supporters. And uh, we are streaming right now live on Twitch, but then the recorded uh, local version that's higher quality will be uploaded to Patreon. So this is part two. Now, what do you guys remember so far from last week? Let's do a little bit of review to help it stick a little more, because that's part of you know the neuroscience of learning. Do you want me to give you a few um, nudges, or do you remember anything from so, Thursday? Um, you know, in, in terms of, um, I actually had a question about uh, the, Great. the actually specifically the reforming part. But I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, so basically, forming is when everyone comes together. Storming is where they're trying to basically figure out, you know, everyone's position in the group. Everybody's so. Forming is when you first meet. Storming is everybody's trying to just figure out how to function. Yeah. Norming is where everybody's trying to get their positions in the group solidified. Mm -hmm. And performing is now it's kind of automatic. So norming, you say, uh, you're the boss, you're the project manager, you're the web developer, you know, you do these tasks. That's mm -hmm. more norming. You know, storming is I'm the boss. No, I'm the boss. No, you're the boss. No, I'm not the boss. Or everybody just stands back and let nobody does anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who does what. That's storming where everybody's stepping on toes and it can be very tumultuous. And in high stakes places with very competitive people, it can get nasty. I mean, you know, you're Microsoft Bill Gates throwing chairs all the time because he throws tantrums and, um, so unfortunately, that sets a culture in that company of that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, other places have more professional mien 
and do not behave that way. And I expect that from us to have a more professional interaction <laughs> that we can still have. We can still have conflict without it being, you know, that kind of conflict. We can disagree yeah. about stuff, but do so in a civilized, professional way. Mm -hmm. um, but but storming. And I talk as as we do the Twitch show on Sundays with the group. I've been talking about where the group is at in this each each week, mm -hmm. uh, how they're progressing and how they've been in the storming phase. Just started to see a little bit of norming in the last two episodes. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then so that's norming is where finally everybody kind of has their roles well defined, mm -hmm. and they're they're doing their roles, and but it's still being kind of spelled out, and everybody has to communicate a lot of back and forth to make sure mm -hmm. they're not stepping on toes, and everybody everybody is is it norming is a good phase to be in. It's not a bad phase. Mm -hmm. But where the magic happens, where you're more likely to have incredible immersion and uh, flow state mm -hmm. for your work experience is if you hit performing. And then that's where the a lot of groups never get past storming phase, and those are projects that crash or just get reorged and reorged and reorged and reorged. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie works at AT&T right now, previously many years at Microsoft, that AT&T keeps going through reorgs. And then you have to start all over again with the forming stage. And then, you know, everybody's really nice and polite to each other at first during the forming stage. Mm -hmm. storming fa or the, form the storming phase, people start letting down their niceness. Um, it can be really ugly. Uh, and it can still be civilized, but it can still be rough. Mm -hmm. uh, norming phase, you can get a lot done. Projects get complete, everything's great. But you don't really get that feeling of being in the trenches, camaraderie. You don't get that incredible immersion. You don't do amazing things in the norming phase. But you get stuff done. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But if you can get to performing phase, and most many groups do not, if you get to the performing phase, that's where like you can read each other's minds. Like one look, or like all of you are thinking this collectively, mm -hmm. and you're solving problems like this, and you do amazing things. You're changing the world, whatever. That's an amazing place. And I've done it with the SiliconValley.com thing and, and other companies. It is wonderful when you get a group of talented people and you get to that performing phase. And it is it is so amazing. It's a wonderful experience. And same with role-playing gaming. It doesn't happen often that, you know, you don't generally experience it with pickup and short-term games. It requires repeat sessions over the time of a campaign to have a good performing group. And yet, every now and then I have experienced a one-shot. Now, maybe some of us are friends or something. Maybe we're all experienced gamers. That's the first thing mm -hmm. is, it doesn't, it, you don't get to performing with all beginner players or, or even one beginner player. You can't get to the performing phase. You mm -hmm. have to have skilled, talented people who know what they're doing to get to that stage. So let's say you bring a group together uh, for a one-shot, but let's say it's like a marathon one-shot, like a six or eight hour, 12 hour, 24 hour, <laughs> like we did with, uh, sure that almost did with, uh, <laughs> well, there, there may be some argument for that, <laughs> but you, you do a long session where a lot more can happen than just a three or four hour standard session. And you do it in an environment that isn't highly distracting. So not, not at a convention necessarily, or if it's late, maybe late night at a convention or something, yeah. but you meet people and you may have never met them before, but you're all experienced gamers and you don't have big egos to get in the way. Cause if you have anybody with a big ego to get in the way, it, then you're going to go straight to storming and mm -hmm. be struggling. But if everybody is there to have a good time and everybody's willing to do some give and take and figure out where they work best rather than where they want to be most. Um, I have seen under these circumstances in one session go through all four phases in one game session, which is amazing to that, that you can reenact something that normally takes weeks or months in the business world mm -hmm. in a single game session. You know, six or eight hours is typically when I've seen it. Um, so it, it's not an, it, it's rare for that to happen. Generally, you will only see it over a prolonged period of time because it takes a while to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. But if you have really experienced, talented people, uh, even in a project, you can sort these things out pretty quickly. If you have a lot of people who are just really good at doing projects and they're used to picking up and going to a new place and you don't have some a-hole in the group who's trying to dominate who shouldn't be, mm -hmm. everybody's competent and everybody knows you know, pretty much their limitations and they're willing to let go of some power and such and, and, and make it work, uh, it can happen pretty quickly. It's just rare. Um, so, yeah, so we'll get into that a little more deeply. Uh, when did Tuckman approximately come up with this theory? Just ballpark decade. 50s? Any other guesses? I wouldn't be able to even hazard okay. this. 1965 is when he published the article on the developmental sequences in small groups. 
Do you remember the type of research he did to come up with it? There were two types. There was one part and then the next part. Meta? That was the second part. What was the first part? So meta-analysis is what he, he kind of went to. What what led him to that? What did he have to do first before literary. he could do that? Part What's of that? Literary review. Literature review, yeah. He had to do a literature review, and then he was able to do a meta-analysis from aggregating that. Um, and then that's when he came up with the terms. And um, yeah. So let's see. Uh, some other review topics. What is... So we also mentioned Avidon interaction patterns last time. What is the number range? I'm gonna throw this to you, Riley, first. Okay. The number range for a small group. Three to nine. Three to nine, that's Four right. Nine. And what do we think it is for role playing, really, realistically? Three to five. <laughs> yeah, three to three to five. Six, you can do six. If you have got a pretty good group, you can have mm -hmm. you can have six. And really with the GM seven. Yeah. So three to seven you could argue. Mm -hmm. Nine would be a really slow group. That's Eight players, we've done it, we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. I've, Eight I've, players the GM I've and it's players, it's, it's slow. I've done twenty. Yeah, <laughs> right? For a prolonged so period. Slow. Um well I sped it up. I, I used egg timer and, and everybody had like 15, 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay attention and be prepared because it's gonna come around rapid fire. And it worked. But it was exhausting as a game master yeah. to track twenty people's I mean, I had to really have my stuff together on my, my roster and everything else and really be on top of it for it to work. It did work. And these were three different groups that were brought together. Mm -hmm. So they had their own dynamics, right? We were talking about factions. What's the minimum number of people, uh, Dan, to, that you have to have in order to have factions? Three. Why is that? Because uh, one person, you can't have a group. Two people, they yeah, they can be against each other, but you can't have two people right. pairing up against each other. Yeah, you have to have two or more. Three is the minimum exactly. to pair up against one person. Exactly. What did they say the upper limit was for a small group, but but is problematic as far as the number? Ten. Well, no. Who said it? Because like, yeah, it was Goffman and some said others. Twenty-five. Yeah, twenty yeah, to twenty-five was the upper limit, but that is a lot of others say no. That's multiple groups, really. Yeah. Realistically. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is a team? A group of people with the uh, a small well, a group of people with the uh, um, common goal. Yeah, it's a it's a it is a it is a is a small group, just mm -hmm. like we talked about, mm -hmm. and it's a special type because they have um, so they have to first meet the definitional criteria of a small group. Mm -hmm. They generally have what kind of skills? Complementary. Complementary skills. That's the key thing. They're not just random. That they're. You're, so when we talk about party balance, mm -hmm. you're bringing a party together to have a balanced team when you're trying to make sure everybody has complementary skills. If everybody's a fighter and you need to go into a dungeon crawl or something, that might not be the best team. It's a small group, mm -hmm. but it's not a team with complementary skills. Unless you have like you know, drastically different builds for the fighters. <laughs> right, yeah. A lot, yeah. I mean, yeah. if we want to... I'm, I'm, let's, let's talk first edition AD&D here just to keep it simple. <laughs> uh, you're talking to the tactician here. Yeah, I yeah. come up with first edition okay. stuff. Okay, well, all right. But uh, you get the A. Okay, so what is a network? John? A network is a intercommunication between groups. Interconnected. Interconnected. System. Key thing is system. System, okay. Because system theory is a whole other thing we'll talk about in other lectures. Uh, an interconnected system of... Of the individuals, of, of, yeah, of, of people or teams. organizations or things, oh. just anything. A network of things. You can have a, a, an Ethernet network. You can, you know, whatever. But Neurons. it's interconnected. Yeah, right. Neural neural pathways exactly. So an interconnected system of things or people. Uh, do you remember the three OSs? <laughs> os, os, and os. <laughs> They were they were the Greek terms, oh, the pathos. three late oh. motifs or dominant and recurring themes. Ethos, pathos, and logos. There you go. Yeah. All right. What? I was thinking they started with OS. I'm like, I don't remember. No. Ostrich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We All right. Talk about ostrich. But but you guys figured out that it was enough of a nudge. So that that's called a a, a cue. That's a memory cue to help you be able to access it. It was available, but you need to be able to access mm -hmm. it. Um, 
So what is ethos? What does that refer to as far as what, what characteristics? Your credibility and your how people look at you and how you appear to people. Good. Like your reputation. Ethos is yeah. Yep. Ethics. Yep. Yeah. Disposition, character, credibility, trustworthiness, and fundamental ethical values. So ethos, ethics. All right. Logos. Logistics. How your brain. How your logic. your your mental facilities on your capabilities of uh, actually performing the tasks. Um, it's uh, intellectual in, in uh, capacity, integrity. Um, it's good to be trustworthy and credible, but if you're not intellectually qualified to perform a task. Mm -hmm. So what was the example they used? Do you um, remember? Uh, brain surgeons trying to uh, change out tires in a... Yeah, racing team. Racing. And a racing team trying to be a brain surgeon. Exactly. Yeah, right. They just they don't have the right logos to do that effectively. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a good mnemonic for that. If you can think of a good mnemonic right. for that, let me know. What's that? What do you mean? So ethos, you think of ethics, and then that helps you remember the traits. Logos, I don't really have a good, like, what's a good reminder? Logic, logic, logic you think brain. logic? Well, yeah. And, yeah. You logically should be in this position. <laughs> okay. Uh, pathos. How you feel about stuff. So. Emotional arousal, right. And, and, yeah, and how the emotional appeal of a message and such. Good. Um, all right. Uh, there were uh, several different types of communication. Uh, well, can you guys remember them? What they are? And this this re references loosely Avanon, right? There's in, there's interpersonal. What is interpersonal communication? Everything's inside. No, no. So that's one to one then. That's one to one. Yeah. Intra intrapersonal, intrapersonal is, is everything's a, inside. Like, and intrapersonal could also be called thinking. Self. Self. So self, self or intrapersonal communication. So yeah, that's that internal thinking and, and, and the internal same thing. It's intrapersonal with Avidon interaction patterns and then interpersonal. So what's above interpersonal? What's the next uh, group after that, size after that for communication? Small group? Yep. Yep. So, and that's, we talked about the size for that. Mm -hmm. um, with the addition of each new member, participation opportunities decrease. So the larger group gets, the less any one person gets to do something. What would be, there were two other uh, communication types that we don't go into as much detail, but they're important to know. Mass. Mass was one. What was below mass? Isn't it group to group? Or? No. Um, public. Public, yes. Public, yeah. so, so it goes intrapersonal, interpersonal, small group, public, and mass. The mass is just a larger scale of public. So public could be one person talking to a group of listeners, person giving a speech, uh, whereas mass is typically more like newspapers, electronic media, things like that. Twitter. Yep, you bet. Uh, some... That was my follower level. <laughs> what did the studies say about the performance of groups versus highly qualified individuals? What percentage... And what did they say? Um, that uh, um, a, a well-formed group um, uh, will outperform uh, the uh, a very the best individual. The best individual. Seventy-five percent. Ninety-seven. Ninety-seven percent of the time. Something ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is from a two thousand study by uh, Lumsden and Lumsden. Um, and it covered about 50 years, and it's another meta-analysis, but about 50 years of research, they, they made that claim. So what are, there were, let's see, three, for the apparent superiority of the group over the individual, what were the three factors? Three factors for superiority of the group. Um, there was a team with everybody having roles. Less likelihood of uh, um, uh, um, being trapped in dead ends. Uh, there, there is that, but there were three specific areas. Um, do you want more time, or do you want me to just review them for you? I, I need a review. Yeah. Okay. So first, pooling of information. So that's where they have different but complementary skills. Mm -hmm. 
so that you don't go down the blind alley, right? So if a solo person can get stuck, as a group, they might, hey, hey, why are you wasting time over there? So that you were, you were, you were having some of that memory of it, right. but that's the pooling of information and, and complementary skills. So that's first of all. Um, oh no, sorry. Second of all was the blind alley one. So first of all is pooling of the common skills. Second is an individual may tend to go down a blind alley, but a group, somebody's usually likely to check you. So you get you get checks and balances. So second is avoid the blind alley. And third is groups can stimulate. So you can bounce ideas off each other, uh, get on a roll, etc. So so basically, so the first one is complementary skills, you know, pooling of information complementary skills. Second is avoid blind alley. And uh, third is the uh, stimulation and getting on a roll and helping feed off each other. When can groups, when are groups not always superior? There are two instances. Um, you lose individualism. No, that's a freedom issue. That was a freedom issue. That's, that's separate. There were two times where in just measuring performance, when two the, time, two the, different types of situations. When the task is really, really complicated and a you know, specialized skill. Really specialized skill. Yeah. Or when it's really, really simple. Really, really simple. Um, right. Very, very simple. Very, very complex. Uh, I guess there's actually one other circumstance. So actually three circumstances. Time urgent. Yes, time urgent. Sometimes it just takes too long for a group. Because it doesn't take a group for me to turn on my computer. Right, right. But sometimes things just need to be done now, and right. that will be faster than trying to get a group to collaborate. Emergency situations, etc. Um, we won't go through all of Erickson's development stages because that's not necessary for this. Uh, the only one I wanted to really mention is because remember I was talking about the different peer groups for the different communication styles. Mm -hmm. At what point? do peer groups become the most significant in stages of development? Um, puberty. Adolescence is the technical term okay. that, that right. psychologists, psychologists like to use. Yeah, yeah adolescence. But yeah, onset of puberty, adolescence, etc. That's where the peer groups are really important. And that's really important to know because we work a lot with adolescents. We work with adults and senior adults and young kids and all that too. But the peer group, very important. So we, we want to be very sensitive to that. Uh, what were the two paradoxes? I said one of them, where if one, you lose individuality when you have a bigger group, and so it's less. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, individual freedom, the need, and the need for group affiliation, it pulls at each other. The other, what, par the other paradox <laughs> is that um, uh, if uh, um, uh, the groups have a tendency to... Uh, um, uh, Try and um, figure out uh, like the social you know, aspects instead of uh, especially when one of them is uh, I, I want to say divergent, you know, from the goal. Um, they try to they have a tendency to focus on that instead of focusing on, on actually on the actual problem. So, for example, the example that you gave is if uh, they need the rogue to open the door, but he wants to go into the other room, they'll argue about getting the rogue to do that right. as opposed to just trying to open the door. Right. So they they spend time trying to solve the social tasks and yeah. they don't accomplish the actual tasks that they're supposed to be accomplishing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there'll be a tension to push them back to doing it and then the so when the social things were addressed, etc. So, yeah, so there, there's a push-pull between actual tasks and solving social issues uh, and that's and important to be aware of. And you don't have that problem when it's just you. <laughs> you can just focus on the task. Unless All right. <laughs> What's that? Unless you have ADHD. <laughs> yes, and, and I struggle with that yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see um, I didn't get this as highlighted as I would have liked and some of this we don't need to cover um, yeah we don't need to worry about primary groups secondary groups um, a formal group operates under the direction of an overt set of rules, while an informal group is directed by an unwritten covert set of rules. So that's kind of worth knowing. We're kind of in between with gaming, where we have overt set of rules about what's happening, 
But we also have an informal aspect to gaming that's kind of more laissez-faire. It lets you play with the rules as opposed to in a business setting where, you know, it's if there is a company policy and you violate that policy, you're Robert easily out. Of order. Yeah. Um, now, in a game group, we have our code of conduct, and if somebody excessively violates that, they're out of the group. Um, now, with mental health groups and stuff like that, we don't have that same luxury. Right. But for our entertainment Can't groups and community groups, it's just yeah. work well, you can you can cancel having a client. Right. Therapists drop clients all the time because it's sometimes in the best interest of the client. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, as opposed to more informal group. Uh, which might be like a flash mob, I guess, or I mean, there's a lot of ways. Or just a if you're playing a really, really rules light thing where it's more improv or something like that. Because again, we're always trying to tie this into role playing gaming. Um, it's often said that the rules of an informal group are written nowhere, taught by no one, but known implicitly by all. <laughs> I'm reminded of the um, a study that uh, oh, I, I'm not exactly sure if it's a real study, but. Uh, um, the uh, the experiment was that they had you know say a bunch of monkeys on a um a, in a cage, mm -hmm. and they put uh, food at the top of a um pyramid. A, a pyramid, but any time one of the monkeys went over there, they could be electrocuted, like all of the monkeys would be electrocuted, and eventually what they started doing after the monkeys learned that if you touch the cage, if you touch the bars. Everyone gets shocked. They started switching out the monkeys, and the, the new monkey would try to get there, and the group would turn on the monkeys like right. to stop that. Yeah. And eventually, they got to the point where none of the original monkeys that were ever electrocuted were were in that cage anymore, but the rules were still, you know, being maintained. So right. none of them would go for the banana, but all of them knew not to go for the banana. Right. right. Yep. And no, I, I. <laughs> I had I was kind of. Uh, glitching last session on I was trying to talk about the Whitehall study. Mm. You know, I just remember it was White something right, for the yeah. British administrative thing and also I was talking about the guy who does studies on baboons um, and I think so just referencing back to that oh the site's down no it just glitched maybe, maybe it just glitched so the Whitehall study uh, examined over 18,000 male civil servants between the ages of 20 and 64 over a period of 10 years beginning in 1967. And a second cohort study, the Whitehall 2 study, was conducted from 85 to 88 and examined the health of 10,308 civil servants ages 35 to 55, of whom two-thirds were men and one-third were women. And then a long-term follow-up of study subjects from the first two phases is ongoing. The study is named after the Whitehall area of London and led by Michael Marmot, uh, found a strong association between grade levels of civil servant employment and mortality rates from a range of causes. The lower the grade, the higher the mortality rate. Men in the lowest grade, messengers, doorkeepers, etc., had a mortality rate three times higher than that of men in the highest grade administration, you know, administrators. The effect has since been observed in other studies and named the status syndrome. So we, I was talking about the, the hierarchical thing and uh, also the study of baboons. This is seen in baboons. This is, this is, and it was, it was from similar research. And I think it was like Robert, is it Pulowski? Let's see. I'm trying to find his name. I know I'll recognize it once I see it. I'm so bad with names. I remember all these data and studies. and Yeah, Robert Sapolsky. Sapolsky of Stanford. Uh, neurobiologist, uh, did studies on the baboons. And he tracked them for like 30 years. He was out in the field all the time. And he would take their blood cortisol, stress levels and such, and a lot of other uh, hormones and such, and track their levels. And the people at the, the, the baboons at the top had the fewest stress hormones and the ones at the bottom had the most stress hormones. And you would watch these video clips of where the top one would nip at the next one down. And then that one would nip at the next one down. And then it would like get more and more severe, more down the chain and more aggressive, the more it went down the chain to the very bottom person was like being, uh, baboon was being mauled. And it's just, and you watch this just happen like real time, just it was amazing. Um, what's even more fascinating is that this so the, the argument is well this is life there's no way around this this is ingrained in us 
and it may be that we're, we tend towards this, hierarchies and such are necessary to function in large groups. Like mm -hmm. we talked about small groups, you don't need a, a, a deep hierarchy at all. You need one person who's at least some kind of leadership, but it doesn't have to be rigid. But when you get in larger groups, you, we talked about the rule of five with directors and managers and such, more than five people. If you try to manage more than five direct reports, it starts to break down very quickly. So that's where you start to create a deeper hierarchy to mm -hmm. keep efficiencies. But then if you get too deep a hierarchy, then you have inefficiencies because it takes so long to get up the chain. So here's this hierarchy, very clear hierarchy of baboons. It was a group of, a troop of 30 or something baboons. And the dominant males, who are the bullies, got into a pile of trash, as they like to do. And you know then they get first dibs on the food. And you're lucky if you're at the bottom of the pecking order if you get anything. Well, all the dominant monk, uh, baboons died. They caught colic or, or, or uh, cholera or something from the, the meat. So all the dominant monkeys died. Mm -hmm. So only the bottom tier males remained and then some of the females. They did not repeat the same hierarchy. In fact, if any of the others started to show behaviors like the previous dominant males, the entire troop would turn on that one that was trying to assert dominance. Hmm. And this stood in place and other baboons would come wandering in or other groups and they would resist this hierarchical group from the other baboons, which is very fascinating. So a little bit of a tangent, but it is important when we're talking about social groups and norms and such. <laughs> Um, but they had to die to do a reset. <laughs> so it's very fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Disaster does uh, breed social change. <laughs> nothing else. The things will, will shake things up. So there are two different types of groups. Now that we're just talking about groups, and well, they're, they're broken into many types. So one way of pairing them is a task group versus a social group. Do you think you can? guess what the differences would be too. I mean, it's pretty explanatory. I'm, I'm guessing social groups um, are really good at tasks and task groups are really good at socializing. All right, that's the comments from the peanut gallery. <laughs> social groups have more fun. Mm -hmm. What do task groups do? Get things done. Yeah, so a task group convenes and labors for the purpose of accomplishing a task or achieving a goal. Social groups are formed and joined so that members can have fun, socialize, avoid loneliness, and so on. Virtually no production qu qu uh, quotas or task completion deadlines are given to social group members. Um, you know, we do not say, tonight everyone must compete 10 units of fun. <laughs> well, gaming does fit kind of a middle line. Sorry, complete, complete 10 units of fun. So, like, yeah, but how do you measure 10 units of fun? <laughs> Three levels of the dungeon and two monsters. <laughs> For some one person, that would be horror, and other people, that would be a blast. Uh, in social groups, members are satisfying their socio emotional needs and are not seen as having to take time to also satisfy task needs. Satisfaction implies socio-emotional factors. Um, but So here again, there's support for the all play, no work aphorism, um, and the fact that social clubs and organizations, Kiwanis, Rotary, Lions, uh, become service clubs. They give themselves tasks to complete. So it, it's kind of, you know, all play and no work, and all work and no play, you gotta kind of have a balance between the two, because any, any too extreme of one or the other, it, our lives don't feel uh, as fulfilled. Uh, another one, a differentiator, is therapeutic and non-therapeutic groups. So uh, the, for a therapeutic group is a per, is, has a personal suffering, which leads the sufferer to voluntarily enter a therapy group. Um, and then there's also the avenue of involuntary, which occurs when someone, you know, like a legal edict or something, uh, dictates entry into the group. So four, uh, there's four basic defining, this is important because we do, you know, you guys aren't there yet, but John and I are, and we hope some of you will be interested, uh, work with therapeutic populations and in therapeutic settings. Mm -hmm. And so there's four basic defining characteristics of a therapeutic group. One, the group is led by a professionally trained therapist, certified by a professional association and licensed to practice. Thus, we've been talking about our standards with certification as role-playing game therapists and such and any other associated certifications. But you, 
just because you're a certified therapist doesn't mean you're going to be any good at bringing role playing games and using it as an effective therapy. Yeah. It's just like any other treatment modality, there should be specific professional training and standards and certification for that modality. Just like with neurobiofeedback, there's training certifications, uh, you know, many, 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 many other modalities. Number two, the rules of everyday social interaction are suspended or replaced. So you create kind of an artificial bubble. Um, and so, for example, in a therapeutic group, members might cry, shout, insult, confess, disclose very personal information, and speak for long periods of time. Those are communicative behaviors that would not be tolerated in everyday discourse for any length of time, right? <laughs> that right. would be, unless you're a teenager. <laughs> then we put up with it, because they're teenagers. I've lost their butt. Sorry, Riley. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> maybe, you know, they're maybe present company excluded. Who knows? <laughs> uh, number three. He has his emotional <laughs> The therapist believes that there is something in the group experience that is therapeutic. Um, you know, so that you're not just doing it just for the heck of it, that there is a therapeutic reason for being there. Number four, um, a therapy group is it provides the socio-emotional support for its members who may feel lonely and isolated physically and or psychologically. And we do a lot of that. Um, you know, like with the deaf community and others, because they get uh, very frequently isolated. Um, whereas non-therapeutic groups are defined by default, that is all groups that are not therapeutic. <laughs> however, however, it could be argued, and we have with role-playing gaming, that there's some therapeutic value to almost all groups, particularly social groups. The sheer just presence of others who can contribute to satisfying socio-emotional needs is therapeutic. The when you don't have it, you Between you directed go nuts. and undirected. Sure, there's, there's more free form and task-based versus social-based and such. Um, so various types of groups also could be, like specific types could be family, adolescent groups, work groups, self-help groups, uh, growth groups. Uh, so those are designed to help participants realize their full potential in life, and that's part of what we do. We try to, we're, we're hoping with our gaming and such that we're helping people realize their full potential. Um, T groups, so this is not a common one, consist of a set of ex, uh, experiential educational designs for understanding the self in relation to others with the small group membership providing both the context for learning and crucial feedback and emotional support for the learners. So these procedures were developed in the National Training Laboratory in Bethel, Maine in 47. Uh, growth for an individual in a T group emerges in three-step processes. So unfreezing. They're provided with a, what's that, John? T-T-E-A? No, T -T -E just the letter, big letter T dash groups. Okay. Because I was um, thinking like tea times. Like, yeah, no, no, not, <laughs> not tea group, no, that's a social group. Um, so they are provided a supportive environment that allows open expression of things thought but never said and of actions contemplated but never carried out. The threats always felt to be associated with discussing these things are reduced or eliminated. Uh, so for example, speech after long silence. Um, so being able to talk about suicidal thoughts and aggressive thoughts and things like that that normally would not be appropriate. Uh, testing. So uh, here, new ideas and perceptions about self, others, and the world are tested in this safe environment. We do it all the time with role-playing gaming. Right. Test out all kinds of environments. And we do let people do things in, so the, the unfreezing. You're doing combat in a lot of role-playing games. And a lot of people, there are a number of people who really protest again that we talked about in the talk show. A PhD lost her, lost her PhD because she was so determined to try to create, create whole cloth research claiming that video games cause people to, to ha commit homicide and become sharpshooters and better head shooters and such that she falsified the data. And it took six years, yeah, six years of of people protesting and going, hey, there's something not right here, three before finally the university, yeah, three retractions, and the person's PhD was revoked. We talked about that in our, our last uh, RPG talk show. And uh, so, for example, you know, like Montessori didn't want any violence with the role-playing games we did with them, so we had to do, you know, no thank you, evil, and then the boffers, we, we didn't have them fight each other. People are very afraid of even acting out violence for the because they get this misinformation about, you know, and, and modeling is an important thing. We always point out Bobo the Clown, et cetera. 
but it's also overrated too. It, it has been overemphasized. And one, so the things in role-playing gaming that the research shows is just because there's a lot of violence in a role-playing game does not mean you're going to be a more violent gamer. The research shows that gamers are not more violent, even though they participate in an activity that models violence heavily, you know, for some players. Some groups are more hack and slash, some are not. But they're not seeing that those players are any more violent, etc. And they tend to be less violent than the non-gaming peers, is what we study after study shows, correlative study. Traits and stuff. Yeah. You guys know who Bubble the Clown is? It sounds familiar. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, so Bubble the Clown is studied in the 70s, I believe, where, so they had these videos, sometimes they had videos, sometimes it's through a, a two-way mirror or whatever, but they had children watch an adult walk into a room, and Bubble was this inflatable clown with weight in the bottom, I remember and it was that. designed to punch it so it would go down and then come back up so you could punch it again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. Okay. I used to actually have one. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people. So, so and they might have maybe the adult hit it with a hammer, maybe they punched it, whatever. Then they let the kids go in the playroom, and it's a playroom with lots of toys. And then they had a control group, you know, other kids who did not see a video, or and it, it's called you know parental modeling or model behavior. And so they did not see the model behavior; they just were led into the game room. And what they saw was the kids who saw the parents punching the clown. The, one of the first things they, they did is go in there and punch the clown and hit it and be violent with it. And so they said, see, modeled violence is going to make you more violent. And that has been one of the studies they point to all the time to say, if you watch violent movies, watch violent television, if you do violent role-playing games, you do violent video games, mm -hmm. you will do more violence. Yeah. Read violent comic books. What the research shows is more nuanced than that. It isn't that straightforward. Mm -hmm. And even that research still needs more research. The, the latest research shows that there needs to be trait aspects of the observer. And if that person is already has aggressive, aggressive traits, then they are much more likely to act on that modeled behavior in the short term. Emphasis on short term. Mm -hmm. It does not mean you're going to go out and murder people. The people who do that most of the time have severe mental health issues or were under extreme duress of some kind. It was not because they were more aggressive people. Now, are there more abusive people out there? Are there people who abuse and fight and do all that? Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. And those are their traits. That's part of their personality and such and their traits. And is it more? are they going to be that much more closer to being stimulated into aggressive behavior in that mo uh, short or immediate term? You bet they are. Can you train somebody to become more aggressive? Yes, that's what the military does, right? You do that with lots of things. Oh, yeah. Of course you can with really heavy, constant training with, with, with reward and punishment, etc. But the big question is, is watching television, is playing video games, is playing a role-playing game going to make you more violent? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of debate. And there we go. See, see, this is the proof. See, see, this is the proof of both sides of the argument. Um, and whenever you see that, what it means is you need to be more nuanced about it. You need to know who you're working with. If you bring in somebody who ha may have some cognitive impairment, some, some mental health issues, maybe on the autism spectrum scale, ADHD, or, or, or uh, conflict, you know, they, they have high it's traits of aggression. Yeah, then you need to be careful about that. That's going to be something. And you don't always know when you're just running a game with somebody who those are going to be. But... It, the research is not good because, as I said, a lot of these studies have been disproven. They've been discredited that claimed, and this one was the click boom headshot one, whatever, yeah. click boom headshot, some was from 2012 that has been completely discredited. And yet, it the discredited, nobody's seen. It's a little tiny retraction. Nobody ever sees it. And people still on, on the cable television news and broadcast television, newspapers, articles, professional journals are citing that kind of research, which has been completely disproven. And that's part of the nature of science and such that you go through these phases. It, you it know, means my biases must be true. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it, uh, Euclidean geometry and Einsteinian theory and and and. You know, uh, all these, uh, I'm, 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 uh, there's a specific one I'm looking for. Dar sorry. Uh, Darwin? Not Darwin. Um, gravity. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, oh, my gosh. I hate when I mind blank like this. Falls on your head. Yeah, yes. Falls Newtonian? Your head. Newton. Newtonian. Newtonian. Thank you. Newtonian theory versus Einsteinian theory. But it has big time. Mm -hmm. And 
the universe was the way it was according to Newtonian law and could not be any other way, except that it didn't explain certain things very well. And Einstein's theories explained them much better, but were at direct odds with Newtonian theory. And the, you know, well, millions of people can't be wrong. Oh, yes, they can. And the, the <laughs> entrenched <laughs> scientific, you know, people were really resistant to Einstein's theories and such. And it took a long time to come around. And you see this all the time. And, and so we always have to keep that in mind that these things are, we're still learning and figuring these things out as Same we go. Same thing with Galileo. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and then finally, refreezing. Uh, where new ideas and perceptions are integrated into an individual's attitudinal belief uh, repertoire, and then that's where the growth occurs. So they get they they learn they unfroze their previous concepts, challenge them, try new things, mm -hmm. they test them out in a safe environment. Role playing gaming allows for that, big time. Where you can go ahead and hack up a hundred orcs and see how it goes. And then I like to throw in, like, oh, yeah, you killed the little baby orcs, too. How do you feel about that, right? <laughs> you know? Oh, a snot you think about it's that. Oh. In, in <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, you can, you can totally play with that. It's a safe environment to do it in. But, again, you wanted to have it somebody doing it. You don't want to get some uh, somebody who's not adequately trained to do this and with a population that's vulnerable. Um and you want to, so you want to be careful about it. <clears throat> um, there's marathon encounter groups. So these, like these, would be. Um, I wonder if they mention that in here. So these can be like 16 to 40 hours intensives. Like you may or may not get to go to sleep. Um, so some early examples are what have now become landmark education, the forum, but was originally uh, EDI, EID. Oh, I can't remember now. Gosh darn it. Um, EST, that was it. It was originally EST and then later Landmark Education Forum. And these are intensive three days and then they have ongoing weeks later uh, to re really challenge your thinking. But these also can be called retreats. Uh, we've Oh, actually the next one is EST, Erhard Seminars Testing. So that's actually, okay. So, but Marathon Encounter Groups. Um, not my, not uh, mind washing. Well, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's the argument. Uh, a marathon encounter group is a group where there is an intensification and acceleration of genuine encounter through a deliberate instigation of group pressure focused on behavior change. There's a lot of camps and such that do this. This is facilitated by a time extended schedule requiring uninterrupted sessions lasting from 16 to over 40 hours. As you can probably imagine, when a group is confined to a given space for long periods of time, group pressure begins to arouse the emotions. The polite, gracious, game-playing, phony behaviors that participants exhibit in the beginning of the marathon session begin to give way to more honest and authentic behaviors that often are less gracious. Participants begin to level with one another. Uh, it's truth-telling time. Conflict often emerges and emotions are high. Participants are asked how they feel at the moment and are told how their, uh, um, how their feelings contradict their actions. The accusatory word phony is thrown around with great frequency. For example, if, if participant Joe says he never plays games, shouts of phony undoubtedly fill the air. Joe's assertion stands in contradiction to the other participant's per perception of him. Joe must now work on this contradiction and perhaps come to realize that his assertion was in conflict even with his own feelings. Out of such realizations, growth is said to occur, and hopefully a new, more honest and authentic Joe can re-enter the world. So you see a lot of retreat groups do stuff like this in many, many, many different ways. We generally, in our retreats, don't we don't do the intensive like that. We do intensive gaming and stuff, so you get right. a lot of knowledge quickly. And it does put some pressure. People do feel the pressure, but we do not take it to that degree. Um, we're not trying to do that kind of, mm -hmm. that's, you have to be really careful with that. You don't have to kill the entire party. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It, it does happen. But I, the article, the side note from the things is that the idea that the negative features, their negative self is your true self. Well, it doesn't have to be negative. It's part of the process of letting down. So a lot of times you can be very, very polite and disingenuous. And you're not really saying what you... So there's a difference between saying, I'm calling baloney on that, and saying, 
you're a racist prick, right? Something like that, right? Using some really name calling is very different than saying, no, I'm gonna call baloney on that. I, I think that contradicts your actions and what you're saying totally. I'm calling you on that. That's different, right, than calling names or something. Right. Um, so uh, that's an important, and so you have a moderator who manages that. Now, these groups will let people resort to name calling and say, it's how you feel it now? He's calling you this name, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that's part of the process. So a really extreme version is, and here it is, that's what I was trying to talk about, asked the Earnhardt Seminars Training, um, was named for its founder, Werner er Erhard, a neonym scavenged from the names of two famous Germans, Ludwig Erhard and Werner von Braun. <laughs> uh, in a typical S session, participants gather in a hotel, usually for a weekend. Before them is a marine drill sergeant type who tells the participants that they may leave and receive a refund in the first 10 minutes. After that, they will do what they are told for the rest of the weekend. They will eat, drink, smoke, and go to the bathroom only when they are told to do so. Uh, at least if you don't let them pee, you begin to get their attention. They are told they might have to remain in their chairs for 12 to 18 hours. The sergeant then begins to berate the participants with scatological insults. Some participants try to respond, and the sergeant responds to their responses with biting insults. Emotions begin to run high, provoked by extended confinement, hunger, and thirst. The need for a cigarette, the need to use the bathroom, and the apparently absolutely meaningless and absurd proceedings. With the atmosphere so emotionally charged, participants begin to say things that they would not ordinarily say in public. Dirty words, taboo thoughts, and so on. They attack the sergeant, the proceedings, and in general begin to rebel. Someone will invariably shout, this is a bunch of crap. The sergeant appears pleased and may say, for example, now you are beginning to get it. I don't know if any of you guys have been through any of these. I've, I've been through these. So I can, yeah. Um, so what's going on? Well, the seminar is a metaphor for life. And the participants say, this seminar is a bunch of crap. They are really on their way to concluding that much of life itself is a bunch of crap. This is really, quote, getting it. And just as the participants began not to care a whit about the seminar and what they said in it, they will in kind begin to take the same attitude toward many aspects of their own lives, and that's considered growth in Est. Now, Est peaked in the 70s. Uh, had has oh here they go they're talking about a birth a rebirth in the new century under the new name landmark forum or forum for short uh, the forum promises personal fulfillment through a grueling three day program its parentage est is unmistakable um, and I can tell you guys a little bit more about because I've been through these uh, and variations of it the Cox program and others back in the eighties and nineties and two thousand training or is this it's all training well it's voluntary I paid for these I went and participated mm -hmm. in these things and there's pros and cons to them and some of them some of them are pretty can get pretty loony. Um, and they have people consider these more cult like uh, and some consider, you know, because there is because of the intenseness of it. So a lot of people poo poo the whole Eston landmark thing. And it is not the be all end all that they try to sell it as. That being said, I don't think it's also worthless either from what I've seen. It depends on the person. It's like so many other programs, different programs are going to connect for different people. Just like we do assessments of genre interest in game complexity. What one genre and game complexity connects with one person will not connect with another person. And it's the same thing here. Sometimes some people need a kick in the teeth or whatever to pay attention and snap out of whatever maladaptive behaviors and thoughts that they're stuck in. And some people need a more caring, loving approach and a more tender approach. It's going to depend on the individual. And so what you see with Est and Landmark and a lot of these other groups that are very intensive is some people, and some people get fanatical. There is part of, there is a business model here to make money. So that can be a problem. There can be a little bit of a conflict from that because then they want to sell you more packages and more packages and you go to the regular programs. And it becomes a religion for people. Uh, one of the key tenets in there is, it, so it's kind of like the military. You go in and they want to break you and wipe you of all your previous self and all your previous concepts and then rebuild you from the ground up and reprogram you the way they need you to be to achieve the goals they want you to achieve. Right? Yep. Yeah, you know, whatever your role is. You know, first break you down to doing a rebuild. Yep. Yeah, the way in the model they want. So it's the same thing with this is their model is that 
it's all a bunch of baloney. They take a mixture of Buddhism and Taoism and uh, 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 Nietzscheism, you know, uh, nihilism and all of that. It's all kind of merged together. Some new agey stuff. It's all kind of mixed. So it gets some flack for that for good reason. Uh, but, and then they put you through this. Now, Landmark is a much softer version of Est. It is no way near as intense as Est. Est was brutal. Uh, but it still follows the same thing. And the other thing is they kind of merged. So the, the Est intellectual property, if I remember this correctly, somebody correct me if I remember incorrectly, but I think this is, this is correct. The Est intellectual property rights were sold to three different organizations. And those organizations later became Tony Robbins. You've all heard of Tony Robbins, Mr. Mm -hmm. Smiley. Uh, um, Stephen R. Covey and and um, uh, uh, um, Franklin Covey, where I worked for some time, and Landmark Education. So the Est concepts and property rights branched into these three different areas. And they all have a little bit different focus. So Tony Rob Robbins is very much kind of the very optimistic self-help, but kind of call yourself on your crap thing and change your lifestyle, but he does it his way. And so it's a little flashier, different way. The... Uh, Stephen R. Covey stuff, Seven Habits, Highly Successful People, What Matters Most, all those books. I had to go through all of those when I was at Franklin Covey. Um, I was corporate architect and director of operations and director of security and all that there at different times. Um, and But they tend to, besides the individual help, they're more project management oriented and business oriented right. on how to really organize your life. It, it, it starts personally, but then it keeps pushing towards, you know, how to do this in your business and you, you build on those layers. Very effective. And and he gets a lot of money to speak. Uh, and then Landmark Education. And those programs are like $400 for a weekend or something like that. And, um, and it's intensive and they will call you on your stuff. But all of them, you get what you put into it. If you put, if you really put your heart and soul into it and you really want to change, if you've reached a point in your life of pain, and nothing else seems to be working, it might work for you. It might not. Therapist might work for you. Therapist might not. Medication might work for you. It might not. It's going to be different for each individual. Um, and so I think a lot of people do a disservice to people who I have seen have their lives turned around by these different programs. The majority don't, right? You know, if you have a third of the people whose lives are improved and two thirds are not, which is kind of what I see, Okay, that's still, you know, 30% of people's lives who got better from this program. They didn't have to do medication. They didn't have to go through three years of therapy. They didn't have, you know, whatever. They, their lives were really bad. They reached a pain threshold. Now, could they have also maybe benefited from these other areas? Maybe. We'll never know, right? Because of the, the, the variables. Um, the, and the problem with all of these, any program, no matter what they are, is, of course, how good the facilitator is. If, they, if it's well run, you may get a lot better uh, product than a poorly run one and there are all of these no matter what therapist these programs there are bad ones that do harm they're not supposed to but they do um, so uh, just a little bit about that but related to role-playing gaming we've I don't know if you've done any Riley but we've done intensive game sessions <laughs> Played like an entire weekend straight through, didn't sleep, whether it was video games, uh, board games like Axis and Allies, which never ends, uh, role-playing games. We did our tried to do a 24-hour extra life for the, the hospital raising thing. So close. Well, it's only because YouTube lied to us. Yes, it was. YouTube said that like nobody was watching at 4 in the morning. So we, we just stopped at 4 ahead. in the morning, like just 3, 4 hours short. So we're like, well, nobody's watching. We might as well, you know, we, we were still playing. We, we'd set up down in the basement. It turned out over 700 people were watching, but YouTube's real-time reporting sucked. We stopped with over 700 people watching us live at oh, four geez. in the morning, and we didn't know. <laughs> and I've never had numbers like that again. Never, never. <laughs> oh, man. And, well, we haven't had Extra Life again like that. You've done it in some stores, but we haven't broadcast. Right, no, I haven't had a broadcast yeah. one. Well, we should probably do that again, but it's grueling. We're on a game for 24 hours straight. He was the GM. It's exhausting, and it will. People start to get punchy, and <laughs> things happen. If you start going two or three days of that, whoo, you start to you start to get those people a little more intimately. It may not be their best side. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so formal groups operate by a set of rules, and informal groups do not. True or false? True. Any dissenters? Yeah. Okay. Formal dissent or informal 
What's that? Give it, Gunner. <laughs> he will be punished for his puns. <laughs> Um, unfreezing and refreezing are concepts associated with. I want to say test. Nope. That came later in discussion. You were asking how it was spelled. T. T groups. Hmm. All right. Yeah, this is going to take a while to get through all this, but. It, Finding it interesting, finding it of value, looking at role-playing gaming a little differently and the social interactions going on there, the dynamics. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, entire course on this one book. Uh, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> uh, let's see. What I mean by entire course, I mean like a, a semester. RPG.education. <laughs> it's all stuff I got to upload. Um, okay. So recall before that a team is what? A uh, small group of uh, um, uh, people with uh, complementary uh, skills. Right. So, and what do they have to, what criteria do they have to meet first for it to be a team? He said something, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really simple. Yeah, working towards a common goal. Uh, well, well, before they're to to be a team, before we be get into, group. they have to be a small group. They yeah. have to meet all I, the definitions. I literally of small started group. Yeah. Right. yeah, he said it was a small group. Yeah, and then we I know. asked for clarification. But, what but, he already and, said. And what is a small group? Um, uh, three to uh, um, generally three to nine people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're just uh, it, it, repetition's yeah. important because that way it'll stick better for long term. Mm -hmm. So team members must have complementary skills. They must be, we didn't, we didn't review this this time, so you probably don't remember, committed to a common purpose. Yes. Okay. And sense. they must be accountable. Remember that from mm. last week, yeah. accountable? Okay. So, and this again applies to role-playing gaming, right? We, we have a group here, we want to have complementary skills in the group. Um, they're all committed to a common purpose, the, the campaign, the adventure, whatever, to work together cooperatively. Mm -hmm. And they're accountable for their actions, which we do through both a, literally an accounting system of the game and a, a token-based economy that, in the game, whether it's experience points or treasure or what have you. Uh, so that is important. And they will disband when they've achieved their purpose or goal. And that's one big difference from role-playing gaming. That may or may not happen. If it's a one-shot or a short group, you bet. They'll disband. Right. Mm -hmm. But if it's an ongoing campaign, there's no formal disbanding. It may They may eventually fizzle out. Or not. World longest running campaign, it's right? 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where, that's where an adventure group is different from a team. There isn't necessarily the disbanding thing. The adjoining. the adjoining, it doesn't the adjoining exactly. Possibly not. Exactly. Happen. So advantages of teams. So since they're newly formed to solve a problem, teams are not burdened by the baggage of history. Because they are newly formed, there is little chance that there will be lingering and smoldering animosities as there might be in long-standing group. No member of the team is waiting to get even with somebody else. Now, the problem is in a neighborhood, so I ran into that when I was doing all these experiments back in 2010 through 2012. I had people who had hated each other since high school, and I didn't know it. And it was all this animosity glaring at each other across the table. And I'm like, what's going on here? I didn't see them say anything. And it had gone back 30 years in the past. Um, and then later, you know, by working with them, turned them into, in the game, their characters were best buds. They were the most efficient power duo in the group. Outside the game, it never changed. They still couldn't stand each other. Their personalities were too in much in conflict. In the game, they were the most effective pair in the entire group. Um, which was great, uh, still, to overcome that after 30 years of hostility. And, and kudos to them for sticking it out to let me try to make that work. They could have just gone, I'm out of here, you know. Instead, they, they made it work. But it did require ma maintenance. I had to maintain that for it to last because when I stopped doing it, it took years. But finally, five years later, they, 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 it, it, it devolved. They weren't functional anymore because I was no longer there to manage, manage that relationship. I was going to comment before you give the example on how, um, while it says, yeah, a new team of 
people, they don't have any previous history, that's really hard to do within any organization to uh, create a team organization. of where everybody, nobody knew each other beforehand. That happens all the time in tech. All the time, whether you're contractors or employees, like Franklin Covey had what five five thousand employees. Devon Energy had ten thousand employees. You never, <laughs> you had your little sphere, and you never, you rarely, yeah. It was really easy to do in large corporations, small companies, and small towns. Totally different story. Right. I mean, I don't know half the people who volunteer in this. Right. We're only seventeen, yeah. and you don't know half of them exactly. We 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 need to form. We're trying to plan a potluck party so that everybody gets to meet each other. And we're, yeah. And a year ago, it was six people. Right. Everybody knew everybody. Right. It's already changing, and that changes dynamics. You know, we're referencing people who are like, I have no idea who that is. Uh, you've never met Danielle, right? No. Nope. And, and she's like one of the, the core core people that's been you know here. I think she's so Jacob and Ryan were on board before Danielle, but she came on not long after that, right. in February of the year before. So. Yeah. I officially came on in November of 2016. Okay, cool. Uh, on the other side of the coin, members of a long-standing group might become bonded by positive emotional experiences to such an extent that they can no longer criticize each other's ideas and as a result become ineffective. They don't want to hurt the other person's feelings because they care about them. And so bad decisions are made mm -hmm. because they don't want to upset them. That happens. Can you think of some game examples where that's happened? Well, if there's like a boyfriend and girlfriend, you mm -hmm. wouldn't want to mm -hmm. <laughs> get mad. Yeah, that's one. A lot of people always go to that example because <laughs> <laughs> you because you don't want to have to sleep in the doghouse that night. <laughs> um, teams are nimble and flexible. They can respond to the present problem efficacy. Uh, efficaciously and without hesitation so as a small team right small unit size as opposed to a large group which is hard to move a large group corporations are harder to move a team can respond nimbly and with complementary skill sets can usually hopefully be effective because teams are more nimble and respond faster they can help an organization survive in a very competitive global world and I've been on many of these teams I've been brought in um, uh, internet shopping network home shopping network you guys familiar with those um, they were getting ready to move 40 something major servers from Mountain View, California down to Irvine, California. These servers have been running for at least five years or more. Some of them never being rebooted Dang. and they're going to be powering them off, put loading them up in moving trucks, driving all the way from Northern California, to Southern California, unloading them, setting them back up again in a weekend. Um, what? This is Go scary, wrong. and you know their downtime was something like a thousand dollars a minute or ten thousand dollars an hour or something. I forget. It was a, you know being down was going to cost them a lot of money, so being down any longer than absolutely necessary, you know, is catastrophic. So they had brought in they had you know they had all their core IT department just running the daily operations, but they none of them had experienced moving servers. So they brought in a team from India of five or six people from India, and they were doing an assessment and writing down, you know, figuring out shutdown procedures. And they came across some servers that nobody knew how to shut down. They did not know how to, sort of flipping off the power and potentially corrupting the database and never coming back up. The server had been running for at least five years without rebooting. So, and it was a specialized skill set. So they eventually found me because I had my 26 page re tech resume on the web, had a Google search, found my unique skill set. This was Broad Vision uh, application server. So they reached out to me and I was working elsewhere. But I said, yeah, sure, for my raid, I'll, I'll come out and sit down and help you guys figure this out. Came out there for a few days. And what happened was the, the, the Indian team kept doing this. They kept hitting the wall. They're doing everything logically and appropriate that they should do and just kept hitting their heads against the wall. And I looked at it and went, well, did you ever try this? And looking at it from outside the box is the cliche. Mm -hmm. And all these other ways of looking at things because their formal training didn't prepare them for stepping outside of these normal bounds. And then I had a specialized skill set that none of them had. So I was like, oh, yeah, this is a problem with this and you need to do this. And boom, it's taken care of. Undocumented features, if you will, quote unquote features. Right. Um, so uh, then I, I helped create a, a proper shutdown checklist and then all the recommendations of what they should do in advance of shutting down, back up all this data. Here's how you back up the data. I created all these recommendations. 
Um, and it was my was my normal 120 hour rate and such, and and so that went fine, and and I got checked for that, and that was in May of that year, whatever that year was, late 90s, and. So then they said, well, we'll need you when we do the move to be there at the new location so that in case anything goes wrong, you can help. I'm like, okay, well, um, you know, that's going to be a tough one. I'll need you to pay me like, uh, you know, X amount of hours, just flat number of hours, and then anything extra beyond that uh, in case it ends up being a lot. Cause, and it's going to be tough because I've got a project. I've got to be back, so I only have that three-day window. And I'm like, okay, we'll do it. So, so they back. I, I, I get down there. And this is the only client ever who 100% followed my checklist and recommendations, right? Clients will follow them to various degrees. Some ignore them completely. Right. Some will follow at 70%. Some will follow at 90%. And invariably, that 10% they didn't follow goes wrong, and then they blame you. Right. <laughs> and they're like, but you didn't follow that part that I told you to follow. They followed it 100%. They bought exactly the drives I told them. They backed it. They did everything exactly to the letter. So now my reputation was really on the line. Because at least you got a little wiggle room. Like, well, they didn't follow my recommendations. Of course that didn't work, right. you know. <laughs> they did 100%. So that was a little nail-biting. And so we're waiting, and they're bringing things. And then the fire alarm goes off, so we have to stop midway. Bringing The servers aren't ready to come up yet, so we have to go outside and wait an hour. And I'm still... <laughs> and I, meanwhile, I haven't done anything yet. I'm just sitting there shooting the breeze with the project manager, waiting to see if these servers will come online. And it's noon by about then. Um, I think it was Sunday by then. So Friday I'm there, Saturday I'm there. Uh, I'm doing nothing because they're just setting everything up. And Sunday is the day to turn everything on. And so the, the big moment comes, and I'm just waiting for. And yeah, some of the drives failed, some of the database, but they, but I, we'd already created. They'd already created the backups. The hot drives are ready. They swapped them out with the ones that failed. Everything came online. I didn't have to do a single thing. <laughs> All I had to do was talk to them, and they're like, okay. Um, and it was because, and then, and there'd been a good team synergy with this group. But I was an outsider, and they had their internal thing, so I was really worried they'd ignore my recommendations. To their credit, they didn't. So everything went really smoothly. We were back up and running by like one or two in the afternoon. Just everything was so smooth. Um, and then I, so I got a paycheck for double what I asked for. And, I and I'm like, I think you guys made a mistake. I'm like, no, we're so happy. But the the thing was, this was a really effective group. Right. Right. They really communicated. They listened to people's special skills. Everybody had their different complementary skills and acknowledged it. We didn't have any animosity towards each other. There were no egos about it. We just wanted to do the best job we could possibly do working together collaboratively. And look what happened. The company put a lot of time and money up front that a lot of other companies wouldn't do to make us figure this out in advance. Right. And they saved themselves a lot of money in that process. So that's where these kinds of teams are really, these troubleshooting teams and such can be really powerful. Big company can't handle it. Small company can come in and can make or break a, a larger organization. Really can. Um, teams thrive in an information society when information is widely available and delivered instantaneously. There's no need for information to be passed down by superiors. The information is already there. You don't have to go through the hierarchy. Right. Is what that says. Teams thrive in an environment enriched with communication technologies. Team members have multiple modalities to communicate with each one another. Another, though that can go too far. You can, like, we struggle sometimes. Like, well, did you catch it on Discord? No, but what about on email? Yeah, okay. You can have too many venues where you, if you're not checking all of them all the time, you're going to miss something. So you have to be careful and moderate that. Uh, teams thrive in an environment enriched with. Uh, okay, uh, teams can provide socio-emotional reward, which comes from the satisfaction of targeting a goal and achieving it all in the context of a group of newly met strangers. Boy, were we happy after that project. <laughs> we were all so nervous. There was so much on the line. There was so much money per minute. Um, it could have been so catastrophic. We've all been on catastrophic projects. And it could have been so bad. And it was so wonderful. And so we kind of felt like, you know, we'd gone through the trenches and there was a camaraderie right. there. Um, you know, high-fiving and just like, yeah, it worked. It all came online. Bad brothers. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we get that with gaming, of course, where when it goes well and you beat the boss and you get the loot and you save the prince, you know, all these cliches, but um, 
it's a wonderful feeling of over when you overcome those challenges and you did it together collaboratively it's even more so than when you do it individually because you get to share that experience like when you just beat the boss alone on a solo game you could be euphoric and enjoy it and then you're on to the next one because it's hard to share that experience with somebody else unless they've also done it too. Mm -hmm. Even if they played the same game, they didn't play it the exact same way you did. Like, did you see that? Did you see that? Oh, I didn't know about that. Whereas if you did it together as a group, you're like, oh yeah, and you remember that? And we get our war stories, the game, mm -hmm. gaming war stories, mm -hmm. that seem to have more accuracy than real life events, you know, in, in the retelling. It's amazing. Teams have fun. Right there, three letter, three words, teams have fun. And since teams are focused on a specific problem, success or failure is easy to assess. Again, with role-playing gaming, that can be a little trickier, but we have lots of measures of success and failure uh, throughout the game setting. So there is resistance to teams. In spite of the advantages, uh, many individuals are resistant to participating in them. There's three major regions, reasons for this resistance. Lack of conviction, personal styles, and weak organizational performance. So some people believe that teams do not perform better than individuals. So because they don't believe in it when they join the team, you create a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you're not cooperating and you've got the skill set and you can kind of control the skill set, you're just like, I don't need them. I don't need them. See, I did all this work. I didn't need them. I've seen this many times. You get these prima donnas and such that happens all the time. The one person who does the project, all the project work and leaves everybody else out of it. Yeah, so what's really important for a team to work is teamwork. It represents a set of values that encourages behaviors such as listening and constructively responding to points of view expressed by others, and giving others the benefit of the doubt, providing support to those who need it, and recognizing the interests and achievements of others. So give each other a, you know, kudos when they do it right. Don't be afraid to speak up and say, no, I don't think that's a good idea, but do it in a constructive way. Have some other solutions. Great idea on the sash there, Dan. <laughs> that helps solve a problem because I was really like, oh man, how do we get this worked out? And and I'm giving you the overt compliment. Like that was a great, great way to solve that problem. So if, if you want to know what we're talking about, listen to the previous uh, re recording from today. Um, you're so, Patreon and listen to the first Yeah, yeah, if you're a Patreon supporter, <laughs> yeah. Uh, personal styles, some people just simply don't like to work in teams. And I'll be honest, there are many times I prefer to work alone. I really, I, I am naturally as gregarious as I can be. I get my energy recharge on my solo time, whether it's composing music alone, going on my motorcycle out in the countryside, or hiking, mm. or soaking in the tub. The, the way you determine somebody's an introvert or extrovert, yeah. according to this theory, is where do you get your energy? If you get your energy from interacting with a lot of people, with people, not, not be huge groups, but with people, then you're an extrovert. It doesn't mean you can't be alone. It's how much you can stretch, but you need to go back to and hang out with somebody to recharge. If you're an introvert, it doesn't mean you can't hang out with people and have a good time and be social and all that, but then you need some solo me time to recharge, mm -hmm. recharge your emotional, spiritual, whatever batteries. And and so I like that particular that. theory of that stretching from a set point. Yeah. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it. So if you're an extreme introvert with you know social phobias and everything, you want to really learn to stretch yourself for your mental health. We are social creatures and need to work on that. Mm -hmm. And role-playing gaming can provide a safe environment for that. But even if you have a personal style of not working a team, um, you know you want you don't want to sabotage the group because of it. But that can be a problem for some people. Some people are better off not working in teams. There are developers I've worked with and such who, yeah, they do nothing to contribute to the team. It's much better to just give them a set project that you know they can handle, say, do this piece, and report back when it's done. And they are so much, literally, we had cubicles with some developers that they had put black plastic visqueeve garbage bags over the top and sides to block out all the light, so because they like to work in the dark. And it's literally signs saying, leave me alone. And I'm like, why don't you let these people work at home? <laughs> you know, which, which my employees I did, but... Um, Anyway, so you need to know where people's strengths are and work with those. Shoehorning somebody into a team who really doesn't want to be there is going to sabotage the team, whether they mean to or not. It's not. They'll dig holes and climb up in trees and shoot their yes. party. Yes, yes, exactly. As we <laughs> yes. keep citing from Spokon last year, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poor Danielle, that was rough. Weak organizational performance. Um, so reluctance to commit one's fate to a team pervades most organizations with weak performance ethics. 
These organizations fail to communicate rationally and emotionally to their people. Performance demands and accountability standards are not made clear, and such organizational environments undermine the mutuality and openness upon which teams depend upon. And unfortunately, that's what kills a lot of projects. It's just not well organized, not well communicated. What are your What are your goals? Did you have a good scope? What's your business scope? What's your technical scope? A lot of groups never do that. I can't tell you how many times I've brought it to a client, whether it's therapeutic, tech, whatever, and they have no scope. They're like, well, we want to make them, we want to make this better, this person better, this project better, this website better. Mm -hmm. Like, what does better mean? Well, you know, better. Like, yes, but we need to define that. And I, my main job is to walk them through figuring out what those traits are, mm -hmm. then writing it down getting sign off on it, and then now you can move forward. Can't believe how many projects don't have that. What are your measurable goals? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that kind of reminds me of when um, I was working on, uh, um, it was called Protosource at the time, it's an animated movie that I was working on. And when I came on, um, I couldn't get a copy of the script. There was no storyboard, there was no animatic, but production had already started. Yeah. Yeah, that happens all the time. People yeah. just jump in with. So if you put, so a lot of people believe you should just do and not plan because they're afraid of what's called analysis paralysis in the tech world. Mm -hmm. And you want to avoid analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis is deadly, and it's a real thing, and you do want to avoid it. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to fall into it anywhere, not just the tech world. You can over worry about all every little detail being right. figured out. And if you're OCD or something like that, it can be even more so. Um, but you do need some planning and you are better off if you're 80% planning and 20% work than if you are 80% work and 20% planning for large projects. Smaller projects, obviously you don't need as much. Mm -hmm. For large projects, you're better off putting more time into the planning like we did with the internet shopping, home shopping network. We spent most of the time planning, right? They worked on that for months. I was there to one week and then a weekend. Um, but they, they planned and prepared over months. I think it was three, four months. It took three, four days to implement. What do you think would have happened if they just went, okay, shut down the servers, let's move them down there, and then we'll bring them up and figure it out after the fact? Dude, how long do you think that, how much downtime do you think they would have had then? <laughs> they could have went out of business. Weeks and weeks. They could have very easily gone out of business. Companies have gone out of business for those kinds of mistakes. So when we continue next time, I guess this is just going to be a few, we're going to, I think this is just so valuable to go through. What do you think, John? I agree. Are you enjoying this level of detail, depth, mm -hmm. finding it relevant and pertinent to role-playing gaming and becoming a better game master and participant? Yeah, um, I did, um, I mentioned that I had a question about the, Please. Um, so we have a forming, storming, ignoring, performing, adjoining, mm -hmm. <laughs> into reforming. Yes. Now... Um, I feel like uh, the reforming is a bit redundant because, I mean, yeah, it's a... It's uh, a different dynamic. It's a diff different di dynamic, but the reforming doesn't then go into forming again. It then goes into, like, I guess, restorming. Right, reforming replaces the forming. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. That, that's why it becomes a different... So you like but, it, but you're just listing the six different types of interactions, oh, stages, okay. the six different stages that could happen. You replace forming with adjoining. Well, I mean, with reforming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they said they had the ideal team. Yeah, so as, nobody knew each other. Exactly. So forming, nobody knows each other. Mm -hmm. Reforming, you have prior history. Yeah. So it's, so like it's a, different than forming. Yeah, it's but it's, it's, it's but an where forming was, you replace. Although, for you, that's reforming. Mm -hmm. For everybody who's new to the team, they're going through the forming stage. Yeah. So anybody coming who doesn't have prior history, they're going through the forming stage. Mm -hmm. You're going through reforming stage, so there is a, mm -hmm. that's why it's worth breaking it out separately. Yeah. I'm now not, those last two came out later. He only uh, suggested those in later decades. Yeah. The 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 four or the core. But because uh, I was saying, you know, if you have, for example, you know, you know, hypothetically speaking, you know, say you know, an entire group that you know they've been together already, so they're going through the reforming stage. Right. They then go through a restorming phase. Yes. Renorming phase. Yes. A reperforming. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, but, you, but you don't. You don't need to re those. You're, you're going to go, potentially go through those just faster. Mm -hmm. You don't have to re them. Hopefully, yeah. storming will be the much, forming much and shorter. reforming would be would be different. Yeah. The rest should be the same. Okay. Because because the forming is the new part. The rest of it is it. You may or may not have experienced people that that will totally vary. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Because great question. I, I was seeing the cycle. It's like okay. Yeah, they're, they're, instead yeah. of being here, they're kind of like here. Sure. Yeah, you bet. So next time when we... Uh, did you have something, Riley? 
Nope. Okay. <laughs> Just finger in the eye. Uh, next time, we're going to continue with team building. So selecting team members, doing trust building, like rocks and ropes, retreats, and games. Hmm. Are we doing trust falls? <laughs> And then some, here's some exemplary team. <laughs> we'll cover some exemplary teams like the Thomas Edison Research Team, the Skunk Works Project. Remember, that was a big deal. I don't down. know about the Skunk Works. Oh. The U-2 and SR-71 reconnaissance planes. Oh. They're the, those are the people who built those, the mm. recon planes. They were really complex. Uh, the ones who made the Blackbird. Apple's Macintosh yeah. Team. Yeah. yeah, Blackbird SR-71. I love that ship. But before that, uh, the U-2. Um, Apple's uh, Macintosh team, the Marine Corps, okay. Cirque du Soleil, Discovery Space Shuttle crew, Lance Armstrong's Tour de France team. Well, I wonder if this has the up-to-date stuff of his uh, <laughs> the trouble he got into. So we're not going to go into we're not going to go into team? we're not going to go deep into each of those teams. We will the first part: building, trust building, etc. In the game, obviously, mm -hmm. the other parts we'll just we'll, we'll cover briefly in passing, just as great examples. Um, and maybe a little more in the Marine Corps. I think that will also. And is so, this Thursday next week? Well, no. So this will probably have to be when our next lecture is. Our this Thursday okay. is going to be games. Mm -hmm. um, next so, week Thursday. Yeah. yeah. So it'd be yeah next week Thursday. You're right. Yeah. So we would continue part three. Um, yeah. I, I think you know. I, I hope you guys appreciate it. If you don't want me going this deep, tell me and I'll go lighter again. But I feel like we're having a pretty good energy I'm, about this. I'm good. I want the deep. Good. Okay. And we're recording it so we can share it with others and I can turn it into, into more. Because I've done this with a number of people, but I haven't recorded it previously. And yeah. I want to try to get this more re re repeatable so we can scale better. So that's where we will pick up next time on that. So what are we going to do this Thursday? What are we running? That was my question. Are okay. We, are we continuing Star Wars? Because we never finished that. First I one. did finally finish all the Doctor Who's. I finally, well, at least the new ones. It's really hard to track down all the old ones. I have a lot of the old ones, but all of the new ever since uh, um, 2000, what, five, six onward, I've watched all of them, the Christmas specials, everything. I'm now up back up to speed, refreshed. I'd missed quite a bit of Matt Smith. He's my least favorite. Uh, he and Eccleston, I found the least um, engaging. I've only um, caught like one or two episodes Tenet, of Doctor and <laughs> I really like, I really like uh, Capaldi, uh, the last one. Uh, he, he, I thought he was a great combo of the first, third, and fourth Doctor in a lot of ways. Um, I didn't like when they tried to make him more cool when he came riding in on a tank playing electric guitar. Um, and they, and he was wearing like band t-shirts for a little, they went through, they, they put him through his little juvenile stage for a little while, I think, to try to make him more accessible to younger audiences. But that went away after a while, thankfully, but I stopped watching after a few episodes of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I stuck it out this time for my research, um, for running the game. Because it got better again. He went back to his curmudgeon littleness that I really liked. <laughs> but, uh, well, a little bit of trivia. He was, he, all the scenes where he's playing guitar from that point forward, all the other episodes, he's actually playing. He was on in a band with Craig Ferguson. Craig Ferguson. Craig Ferguson, the late night talk show, late, late, late show with Craig Ferguson before a few Now he's a game show guy, but... Um, it's now replaced by a, a British guy who that British guy was also in Doctor Who for a number of episodes as well. But um, yeah, so he used to be guitarist in Craig Ferguson's band. Craig Ferguson is also a drummer, so they're both Scottish. And, and so so all the guitar playing he's doing on Doctor Who, he was actually playing. And pretty good, too. You know, I'm, I'm a guitarist among 20 other instruments, and um, so I appreciated that. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing... Um, the new Doctor? Yes. Okay. November, I think, is when we get to see how that goes. It was quite a cliffhanger, literally. She was left fall. She the the TARDIS ejected her out into into air, and she was in free fall, a long ways away from the TARDIS, falling towards Earth. It spat her out. <laughs> that's not a cliffhanger. That's a cliff follow. She, yeah, she'll still somehow survive. Of course, because her <coughs> wife will save her. What? Her wife will save her. Oh, you think uh, uh, um, River Song's going to show up again? Yeah. You never know with time stuff. You never know. Timey wimey. Well, the, if we are going to play Doctor Who, we only have two of the five people that were originally part of it. So. Three? The, you no, have it was Andrew. No, I don't. It was Andrew and then the two people that moved back to their state. Oh, right. Jen and uh, Valerie are gone. So, I don't know. I don't know. I, I want to run it, but 
Wait, I think. Can you have a separate make a character well, day with well, him? We can always do that. It, yeah. it doesn't take that long to yeah, make no. a character. Um, and but I still, I now I need to actually do the part where I actually try to figure out an adventure. So all the adventures that they start with have the doctor, and I wanted to do one that doesn't involve the doctor, yeah. right? That is using the system. So I might need a little more time. The modules for the um, black, the, the vault? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. The, all of that does, but I'm talking about the intro. All the intro adventures have the doctor. Well, the one I ran, uh, we didn't run, but it was ran through with. Um, yeah, Harlan. the supplements have all kinds of other stuff. Well, right. I mean, but I haven't read any of those yet. I was trying to run right out of the box, and I'm like, oh, that's a problem. Then, like, say Thursday, you know, we. So I, I we, think in more Star Wars. Star Wars, but, you know, I. When I come in, make a character, and then we go into Star Wars. Make a character for. Uh, well, that Doctor would work. Yeah, yeah, that would work. We could do that. We could totally do that. Are we continuing the same adventure we left off from last week? Yes. Okay. Because I'd like to finally see the end to one of them. Yes. <laughs> well, A, we want to see the end of it. Yeah. B, we want to get the, the ship dynamics. Right, and we haven't done that yet. Right. So we want to get more, because we started very simple, we need to get more complex to learn the system. Okay, good. So so we'll plan on you running Star Wars, then you've got the box you need and everything, right? No, I nope. left it here. Okay, then make but sure I will reread it. I'll make sure I can reread yep. it. And uh, and we'll make your character. You know, if you show, if you can show up early, fine. If you can't, because of work, I understand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll get your character made so that at least we do. And you have a character, right? Yeah. And you have a character. Are you an adult or a child? Both. I'm an uh, adult who is a third grader. You're a child. You're a, ch a childlike adult. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've done that. My wife ran those very well. I'm playing a professor. Are you in England? Everybody's yeah, in England. I it out. You all ended up in I England. Started, I started in England. Yeah, you don't have to start there, but we, we start the adventure in England. You can be from wherever you want to be. What time period? Uh, modern day, current day. Okay. Current day, everything seems normal. You don't know anything about science fiction or Doctor Who's or anything like that. Okay. So. Because remember, what I want to because this this is one of the things I want to find out is if we can use this for modern day police procedural, which I've been, which we gathered up. Did did they get to see all that last time? Yeah. The oh, cops, yeah. the GURPS cops mm -hmm. supplement. Yeah, we also the talked dart about role dart. play. All that. Okay, good. So I'm at any time to read any of those. Yeah, I'm at any time. I'm I'm not going to have time to do those deeply anytime soon. But so yeah, if we can do that Thursday, then we'll do Star Wars. We'll be broadcasting it uh, from six to nine p.m. Uh, right here on twitch.tv forward slash RPG research. Thank you, Patreon supporters, for your wonderful support. Right after we hang this up, um, after everybody leaves, I will upload this to you, wonderful folks, and you'll get access weeks, months, potentially, <laughs> before the general public. I hope you yeah. found these uh, deeper dives on theory useful. Um, I do know our Patreon supporters want us to talk more about and where we can show more of work with accessibility and, right. and special needs populations. So we want to make sure we also cover those things. And I will, as we get deeper into these theories, I will also talk about how those apply with different populations. Where right now it's such a high level of theory, um, it's not specific, but right. as we your get into it. Your team members are special populations, or when your team is supposed to work with special exactly. populations. Exactly, well, we'll get in a little more detail out of that conversation. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys very much. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the stream here and bid everybody adieu.